Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, down to the end of the chapter. The Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, and thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So that because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and have sat down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. In these first few chapters of the Revelation to the Apostle John, we have a description of the church age, which, uh, of course, had its beginnings at Jerusalem with those 120 disciples gathered together in that upper room after our Lord had ascended back into heaven. The book of Revelation was sent to seven actual churches in Asia Minor, or modern-day Turkey. Uh, in Revelation chapter 1, uh, verse number 11, the Bible says, this is our Lord speaking, He says, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, speaking to John, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. It's interesting also to note back in verse number 7 that in order for these apostles and men of God and old prophets that wrote down the Bible, they had to be in the Spirit. Notice that in verse number 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And that's how they received uh, God's holy word. And so we have uh, from Ephesus, uh, the first church, and uh, representing the early church period. And uh, each of these seven churches represents a dispensation of the church age in which we are now in. Uh, Ephesus being the very early church, all the way to Laodicea, representing us here today in the modern day church period of the last days, which I believe that we are in. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The churches are described as being golden candlesticks. We see that in verse number 12 of uh, Revelation chapter 1. It says, uh, And I turned to see, John speaking, the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. If you drop down to verse number 20, it says that the uh, candlesticks uh, are the seven churches. Um, and notice also that Christ is in the midst. We see that in verse number 13. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. It goes on to describe our Lord and uh, what He will appear like in all His glory. Um, what an awesome thing that's going to be one day to see God in all His glory. Now, people have seen the Lord in flesh, incarnate, uh, approximately 2,000 years ago here upon the earth, but never seen God in all His glory. Probably the only one that ever came really close to that was Moses. Right? We saw God's hinder parts on Mount Sinai. But uh, one day, by the glorified body, and we'll be able to take it, we'll be able to see God in all His glory. Let's just read about it a little bit here. Uh, it says in verse 13, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. That's kind of what you would picture, right, of God. Eyes as a flame of fire. Wow. And his feet like a fine brass, that they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. How many of you ever stood at the bottom of Niagara Falls, or you been somewhere like that? It's pretty awesome, isn't it? The, you just feel the power of all that. 
water falling all around you, you know? Uh, God's voice is like that. Amen. That's my God. Amen. Amen. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, his word. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. See, we, uh, we couldn't take that. Amen. Now, of course, John, he's having these visions in that of the Lord, but uh, even he, you know, it says in verse 17, he fell, his feet is dead. Uh, what a day that's going to be. Amen. And our faith becomes sight. But Christ is in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks represented by the churches or the church periods or dispensations. But Christ in the midst, um, we can shine you know, because He's in the midst. He's in us, right? He is the light of the world, and He has made us lights as well in the world. Because He's in our midst, we can shine. We have something to shine about. We should be shining. We should be shining brightly. And as the world gets darker, we should shine the brighter, shouldn't we? Yeah. Right. Notice we are to shine collectively as a candlestick with several candles like the one used in the tabernacle. Remember it had seven separate candles, but it was called all one golden candlestick. And God would have us to shine collectively. That's why God designed the local church. Yes, we shine on our own, individually, yes. But it's very important that we shine together. That's why it's so important to be a part of a local church where you can work with God's people on the direction of the pastor and it's God's way. And then God blesses it. Okay. There's also a reference here to the seven stars. Uh, verse uh, 16 mentions it. And also verse 20. Verse 20, it describes them. It says the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The angels uh, speak of God's messengers. Uh, the literal definition of the word angel is messenger or a minister of God, an ambassador. There's, most times nowadays we use the word ambassador, A-M, but uh, E-M, I guess would be maybe the older uh, way of saying it, ambassador, uh, speaking of embassy, Ambassador, a minister of the highest rank employed by a prince or a state at the court of another, representing the power and dignity of his sovereign. And that's what a pastor does. He's a messenger. Uh, he's angels, speaking of God's men, God's messengers, ministers that God has in his churches. I know you didn't realize it, but. Uh, you have an angel for you today. <laughs> no, I'm not a real angel, but I mean, I, uh, in one sense of the word, I'm a messenger to give you God's message. I'm a minister, right, of the gospel. Those are those seven stars. And then we move on into chapter 2 and chapter 3, where we have the Lord's specific message to each local church, or you could say to each church, period. And each message is similar in scope. Uh, it starts off usually with some kind of a uh, salutation from the Lord. And as it says there, you know, to Ephesus, uh, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, letting them know exactly who's speaking to them. Uh, someone with great authority. The Lamb of God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords is speaking, letting you know exactly who it is, right? These words, if you have a red letter edition, should be in red. You know, we have all those red letters, should be a red letter Bible uh, in the Gospels, right? And then there's a few places here and there where you see little red letters in the epistles and so forth, but then, then boom, when you get to Revelation, more red letters, lots of red letters, and uh, these. Uh, two first chapters of Revelation, chapter 2 and chapter 3. Words from our Lord given to these churches. So we have a salutation of the Lord. We have also usually an encouragement or a rebuke uh, given. Uh, sometimes we need rebuke. Sometimes we need that. We need to be willing to receive it as we need it, right? God's good to do that. You know, we read the verse earlier, right? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. God does it out of love, right? It's not just being nasty. Right. 
I'm not just trying to beat you up. Nobody wants to help you. Take it as constructive criticism. Okay? Don't take it wrong. Oh, God, you're picking on me. No, don't take it that way. God wants to help you. He wants you to grow. He wants you to keep growing. Okay? Your flesh don't want you to grow. The world don't want you to grow. The devil don't want you to grow. Okay? And all three are doing whatever they can to keep you from growing. Okay? But God wants to help you. His Word wants to help you. The Spirit of God wants to help you. All right? And it's good to get rebuked once in a while. All right? We need it. And then, at the end, he gives a promise to each of the churches. I love these promises. We'll just read the one here in chapter 2, verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to you the tree of life, who is in the midst of the paradise of God. Can you imagine that? And there's, there's all these different ones um, given to the people of God. Those that are true believers. That's who he's talking to. Those that are, are true. And uh, if you're a true believer, you're an overcomer, right? And you can receive these promises. Uh, verse number 11. He that overcometh should not be hurt of the second death. We talked about that last week. What is the second death? Right? Remember that? Um, there's the physical death here in this life, but then there's the second death, and we're severed from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. But those who are saved, those who are born again, They'll never experience it, the second death. Never be hurt the second death. And then to Pergamos, um, also chapter 2 here, look in uh, verse number 17. He says, To him that overcometh, will I give to you the hidden manna, and I'll give him a white stone, and the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. A new name given one day. Won't that be interesting, right? To receive it from the Lord. And then uh, notice in uh, verse number 26, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nation. Remember, we're going to reign and rule with Christ. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. I believe it's a reference to Christ. Amen. We'll be presented, amen, uh, with the Lord one day. It'll be a blessing. To see the Lord. Finally, amen. To see Him face to face. Oh my, what a day that shall be. Verse uh, 5 of chapter 3 to the church at Sardis. Uh, it says, uh, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out His name out of the book of life. In other words, never to be erased. Never to wear this permanent ink. It's permanent. <laughs> I'm so glad it's permanent. Yes. And I will confess his name before my father, before his angels. That's the Sardis. And then we have uh, Philadelphia. Um, verse number 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. This amazing creation of God is going to come down out of heaven, right? And I don't know if it's going to be connected with the earth. I can't quite make that out. If it's just going to be kind of floating over top of the earth. But anyway, it's going to be close by. And uh, this is when God makes a new heaven and a new earth. And, and we shall dwell with God in this city called the New Jerusalem. Now, according to my calculations, I know I've made mention this before, but I believe... It's about, uh, let me make sure I got this right here. Yes, it's about uh, two-thirds the size of the moon. It's big. It's huge. It's not like New York City or Chicago or L.A. or, you know, Toronto or, you know, it's not like that. Because we think of a city, that's what we think of, right? No, this is, this is about multiple levels. This, is, this thing is huge. Okay, it's a huge golden cube. Okay, it's, uh, it's amazing. And we get to dwell with God. You know, the Bible talks about those mansions. We sing a mansion over the hilltop, right? I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, right? And all my life, you know, until just recently, I've thought about, you know, big house, you know, a big yard, you know, maybe a few dogs, and, you know. And, uh, but, you know, I don't think it's going to be like that. 
I looked up mansion the other day in, in an old English dictionary. You know what it means? Mansion means residence. Sorry to break it to you. <laughs> Sorry to bust your bubble. But uh, hey, as long as we're with God, it's going to be nice. Whatever it is, it's going to be nice. We're, be, we're living with God. You know? It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be great. One day we'll be there with the Lord in that new Jerusalem. And then to Laodicea, he says in verse 21, chapter 3, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Can you imagine that? So we read that earlier. Sitting with God in his throne. Will we take turns? I don't know. Will it be like a line? We'll take I don't know. How will it be? What will it be like? Oh, it's going to be wonderful. Is he talking to put his arm around us? Hey, could it be? Can you imagine sitting with God in his throne? <laughs> just, can you just grasp that just for a moment? That you throughout the whole week. Yeah, uh, right. Just meditate on that one thought. One day the promise that's been given to you as a child of God that you'll sit with him in his throne. Hmm. Glory to God. Yeah. If I don't stir you up, your, your stir up is broke. You need to <laughs> get your stir up fixed. Something's wrong with so many precious promises. Let us be those faithful followers and disciples of our Lord that have ears to hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Specifically today to the church of Laodicea because I believe this is the age in which we are, are living. If you go to back to verse, uh, verse 14, it says this is written to us here. Uh, of course, by the Apostle John, but with authority directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. These things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. That could be none other than the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The first thing he says to the church of Laodicea in verse 15 is, I know thy works. This speaks of God's ever watchful eye. We know that the eyes of the Lord, and it says in Chronicles, runs to and fro throughout the whole earth. God sees all, knows all, records all, all the time. The Bible says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show Himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward Him. God's Word says in Proverbs, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Nobody gets away with nothing. So don't worry so much about vengeance upon those who have treated you wrong. Nobody's getting away with nothing. Because God sees all. He sees everything. You know that verse where it says in uh, Matthew, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered? Some of us, it might be a little more than others, but God knows at all times how much how many hairs you have on your head. How does He know that? Because He He's seen all all the time. I mean, it's incredible, you know, that how God knows everything and, and records everything. That's just, I mean, what kind of computer would it take to take in that much information? I mean, how much giga giga is that? I mean, I don't know. That's, that's a lot of giga giga. But that's our God. He is infinite in every way. Infinite in wisdom. Infinite as far as time, existence. Infinite past, infinite future. Infinite in power. That's our God. He's the one that started all this. Amen? That gave you life gave you breath and loves you, wants to save you, even though you're a sinner, even though you transgressed his law, he's holy, perfect, pure. We are not. We are far from it. We are depraved. Given the right circumstances and opportunity, there's no telling what we would do, how low we would go, what we are capable of. There's no telling. That's why we need to be saved. 
I'm so glad there's hope. Amen. I'm so glad that we can experience eternal life. And we'll be made right with God because of Christ and His precious sinless blood that was shed for us. He paid your penalty. He died for you. So your sins could be paid for in full. I could never pay for my sins. I could burn forever in hell. I still wouldn't pay for them. Wouldn't even come close. But Christ, He made the way. And He proved that He was the real deal. And that He raised Himself from the dead. Nobody else has ever done that. Not that anymore. He's the only one. And through Him, we have eternal life. We have forgiveness of our sins. If all we'll do is just receive Him. Right? That's what Bible says. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even those that believe on His name. What a blessing to know Him. It's such a simple thing to come to Christ and be saved. I'm so glad God made it simple. <laughs> so that I can understand it. You know? And be saved. What a blessing. But God's eyes are everywhere, watching, always watching. Watching what we do. Knows what we think, right? Now, the challenge here uh, to the church of Laodicea is found in verse number 16. Well, he gets into it, I guess, at the beginning of uh, verse 15 and, and then goes into 16. It talks about in verse 15, uh, Thou art neither cold nor hot. Uh, I would thou wert cold or hot. So, that because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, God's saying, You make me sick. Overall, this church period okay, makes God sick. In other words, they're half-hearted. They're not wholeheartedly following God. You make me want to puke, God's saying. You're, uh, you're distasteful to me, God's saying. You're not that sweet-smelling savor. You're not like that sweet-smelling steak that your neighbor's cooking on the grill. You're not like that to me. You're distasteful. You smell gross. You smell like garbage to me. You make me want to puke. You're gross to me, God's saying. Verse 17, it goes on to say, The church is saying overall that I'm rich and increased with goods and a need of nothing. But God's saying, no, you're wrong. You're actually in really bad shape. Do you see yourself materialistically or you, you see yourself physically as doing okay or doing well? But spiritually, you're in bad shape, God's saying. You're in real bad shape, much worse than you think. That's what God's saying. Satan, the world, your own flesh has basically rendered you ineffective as a believer. Like I said earlier, that's, that's their aim. The word lukewarm means indifferent. You look up indifferent. Indifferent means neutral. Neutral means not engaged. When your vehicle is in neutral, you can rev your engine all you want, but you're not going anywhere. Right? You're just going to stay right there. As a people of God, we have so much potential, and now that we're alive in Christ, the engine's on. Yeah. Right? And we have a lot of potential. But we can be in neutral and not engaged and not really going anywhere. It's true. This is exactly what God's saying. These are Christians. These are believers God's speaking to here. Okay? The church of Laodicea. So much potential, amen? But until we can put the power down, we're not going to go anywhere spiritually. How's it going with putting the power down? Are we putting the power down? If this applies to you today, you're either lukewarm or have lukewarmness spiritually. And you must admit that you've been neutralized. That's the title of the message today. Neutralized. This is Satan's aim. This is the world's aim. This is our flesh's aim. To see us neutralized. Once you're saved, you can't do nothing about that. But it can sure neutralize you, disengage you, 
Oh, the engine's on. You're saved. Yeah. Vroom, vroom. Right? And all that. Right? But are we engaged? Are we getting anything? Are we growing? Are we wholeheartedly following God? Right. Is He having His way in our life? Truly. This is why you're spiritually indecisive sometimes. You've lost your confidence in the Lord. You're in neutral. Right? You're on the fence. But Satan owns the fence. Right? We're just playing into his hands. He's got you right where he wants you. You're neutralized. And here's the thing. You can be neutralized and not even know it. Notice again what the Bible says here, verse number 17. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And notice the next phrase. And knowest not. You don't know. It's possible. And knowest not. You can be neutralized and not even know it. We must want God to show us what and where we really, truly are spiritually. Let's see if we give a testimony how God worked in her heart and her life. I mean, He showed her some things about her that she didn't see before. But until you came to that place where you're willing for God to show them to you, you didn't see them. Are you willing to see yourself as you really are, not in your own eyes, but in God's eyes? These people are saying, hey, I'm rich, I'm a Christ with goods, I have need of nothing. Look at themselves on the outside. Everything's good. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. I give my tithe. But there's more to it than that. Much more to it. There's a, a deepness to it. There's a richness to it. There's a fullness to it that God wants us to experience. Do you want that? And until you really, truly want that, you're going to struggle. And you may be disengaged and neutralized by the devil, the world, and your own flesh. I'm just telling the truth. Don't shoot the messenger. It's just the truth. Amen? If you've been playing Satan's game, you've lost ground. More than you realize. Sometimes we think, I can play this game. You know? You know you'll lose. You'll lose every time. Yes. And much more than you realize. Because this is all happening to you spiritually. You don't see it. It's not something you can see with the naked eye. Right. right? If it was happening to you physically, you'd get alarmed. Okay? If you went home and half your house was gone or burnt down, then you'd be alarmed. Right? Yeah. Your car was stolen and you'd be alarmed. These things can happen to you spiritually and you don't even know it. Right. You don't see them. See what I'm saying? Satan can rob you, the world can rob you, your flesh can rob you, and you, you don't see it. It's just a, it's a spiritual thing. Good. You need the Spirit of God, you need the Lord to help you to see what's going on. Satan wants you to stay in this neutralized state if that's where you are. Because you are for the most part then ineffective as a Christian. That's exactly what he wants you to be. As long as you think you're okay because you say, well, at least you know, I'm not gung-ho for the devil. Okay? As long as you have this sort of an attitude with God, you'll never be gung-ho for God. As long as you're kind of in between, you know, well, I'm not too far to that side. Or you, you, You're playing games, you know? We need to choose sides. And realize that Satan may have lulled us into a neutral state. Remember those countries in Europe that were neutral during the wars? World War II, I think uh, Ireland. Was it Switzerland? Portugal, Spain, some of those right? Remain neutral. Right? Didn't want to choose sides. That's where Satan wants you to be. Well, just kind of neutral. 
I'm going to try as much as I can to make my flesh happy, you know, and still serve God. I'm going to try as much as possible to make the world happy and still serve God. I'm going to try as much as possible to make the devil happy and God happy at the same time. You'll lose. You're going to lose. Let's choose. I mean, like Joshua. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Like Elijah when he came to the people in 1 Kings chapter 18. How long halt you between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, one of the old false gods in the Old Testament, then follow Him. Some of you may not be in church this time next year if you don't get serious about committing to God right? and allowing God to show you what's going on. Maybe sometimes we just want to live in ignorance. We don't want to know. Maybe we don't really want to know where we are spiritually. We just want to believe that everything's okay. Preacher, just tell me everything's okay. Preacher, just tell me I'm a good Christian. Preacher, just, just preach some sweet things to me and pat me on the back and tell me I'm doing fine. Would that be a good preacher? Would that be a good doctor? If he told you and he knew you were sick, he knew there was something wrong possibly with you and didn't tell you the truth, would that be a good doctor? It'd be a terrible doctor. You'd want to fire him, right? Get rid of him. No, God needs to help us. Amen. God's Word wants to help us. The Spirit of God wants to help you. Okay? This passage of Scripture in uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 reminds me of another passage. If you could just turn it with me, hold your place there in Revelation. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5. You know, I've heard the saying, uh, ignorance is bliss. Is that how you're viewing your spiritual life? Spiritual ignorance is bliss. Well, preacher, don't preach too much to me now. You'll make me uncomfortable. I might have to uh, deal with my soul. I might have to deal with my heart before God. Preacher, don't preach too much to me. You'll make me accountable to God. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21. The Lord says, Hear now this. Jeremiah 5, 21. Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. This is basically what God tells the church later to see it. Tell them the same thing. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord, will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea by a perpetual decree, that it cannot pass it, and though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they roar, yet they cannot pass over it. But this people hath a revolting and a rebellious heart. They are revolted and gone. Neither say they in their heart. Let us now fear the Lord our God. They can both the former and the latter in his season. He reserved in us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned away these things, and your sins have withholden good things from you. God's a good God. He's good to all of us. Rains on the just and the unjust. Sun shines on the just and the unjust. But God is, is a very good God to His children. And He wants to do special things. Just like a normal father or a normal mother wants to do for their own kids. God wants to do that for you. Many times we hold Him back from that because of our rebellion in our heart. Because of the concessions we've made with the devil, the world, or the flesh in our life. And we hinder God from those special blessings that He wants to give us. Oh, He's good to us all the time. But I'm talking about above and beyond that. The really good stuff. You know? That's what God's interested in doing for you. But we hold Him back. When we allow ourselves to be neutralized, disengaged, we hurt God first and foremost, and then others, and then ourselves. When we're not wholeheartedly hot for God, zealous for God, ardent 
for God. The word ardent, you know what it means? Much engaged. Engaged! Put the power down! Having power with God! God on you! God living through you! Using you, empowering you. The God of heaven and all the universe having his way in your life. This is what God wants. It's what he's deserving of. Did he not save you completely? Has he not done a good job? He didn't save you half-heartedly. Why would you want to live for him half-heartedly? He didn't let you in heaven on a lease for a little while. Well, we'll give it a year. See how you do. He's promised you eternity with him. Eternal bliss and glory with God Almighty. He's given you everything. You can't give your all to him. God help us, amen? Now the Lord challenges us here further. If you go back to Revelation, chapter number 3. It says again in verse 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, Poor, blind, and naked. So the Lord says here, verse 18, I counsel thee to buy of me. So there's two things here that he points out to buy of him um, that will fix this wretched and miserable spiritual condition, which he describes as being poor, naked, and blind. Number one, we're, we're poor, so we need God's pure gold. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. So that's the first thing. So we're poor, so we need God's pure gold. These things, notice he says, buy of me. They involve work. They must be earned. Does not the Apostle Paul say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? God desires to enrich his saints, but there are those who are not willing to put the effort into it. Those of God's people not willing to study his word. Right? To put the effort into it. And so they don't receive the golden nuggets from God that makes us rich. God has them there for you. They're all there. But God's word is more like a mine, not a garden. Where you just go along and just pick things off the surface that are growing and oh, you know, it's good. that would be too easy. We have to dig. Sometimes we don't like to hear that. We maybe want to just do a little quick thing with God each day and just kind of fit Him into our schedule, you know, if we can. Um, no, it's, it's got to be more serious than that. Okay. But if we're willing to study to show ourselves approved unto God, right? Study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman. Notice, Paul says workman there to Timothy. Speaking of work, Right? That needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How much work are we putting into our spiritual life? You say, Pastor, I don't have time. Now I know sometimes we're strapped for time. And God's good. Man. He, he understands. Right? But we need to make time. Right? In our schedule. To spend time with God. To truly dig. Truly study His word. And say, God... Give me something. I want something personal for me. Something special. Just for me. Right? You can read a passage that you've read a thousand times or heard preached a hundred times, but 
then God can give you something. Wow, where did that come from? You know? And that's just God. He gives you those gold nuggets. Are you getting that gold, Christian? Are you getting some gold? Or is the Bible kind of dry and just not really getting much of it? Well, then you're poor. Right? You're poor spiritually. You need to buy gold. Gold tried in the fire. God's pure gold. It's nothing like it. Amen? Those precious golden nuggets God has for you. Are you getting any gold, Christian? God wants to enrich you. Will you be enriched? Or are you just happy playing your games with the devil in the world and the flesh? Getting your little fling, you getting your little thing, you know, whatever is going on between you and the flesh and the world and the devil. Huh? No, no, those are tr- those are nothing. That's nothing. That's junk. Okay? That's like the stuff you get from uh, I don't know yard sales. You know, they, other people's junk. God gives pure gold. Pure gold. If you want it. You gotta do a little digging though. Right. Gotta buy it of me. Gotta earn it. Gotta work. Right? But if you will, you can have it. You can be yours. God wants to give it to us. So we're no longer poor spiritually. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, try in the fire, thou mayest be rich. And then he says that the, also that we need white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. So the next thing is we're naked so we need God's white raiment. So instead of shame, that's what the devil, the world, and the flesh brings to your life. Shame. Instead of shame, when you're naked, you're you're shame. You should be, right? Instead of shame, God closes us, clothes us, his people, with his holy boldness, makes us unashamed. So back to our previous point. We're poor, so we need God's pure gold. Why have you nothing to share about Christ? Because you're poor. Right? If you don't have anything to give, if you're not enriched with Him and the, the gold, right? You don't have anything to share. You're poor. Likewise, number two, why are you ashamed of Christ? It's because you're naked. If you're ashamed of Christ, you're naked. Somewhere in your life, there's shame being brought upon the cause of Christ in your life, spiritually. We need to come clean from those things in our life that bring shame to our Lord. And then, over time, amen, God can grow us in His confidence as He clothes us with His white raiment in the King's garments. When you're wearing kingly garments, you have nothing to be ashamed of. That's right. God gives you that confidence. Right. Are you ashamed of Christ? You're naked. Naked spiritually. You need God to clothe you. First John says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. Somewhere in your life where you're shaming our Lord, you'll lose your confidence with God, right? You'll be shamed. You'll be shameful. You won't have that confidence. When you're clothed, you have confidence in the public. <laughs> right? Yeah. you didn't have any clothes on, you wouldn't be very confident. Same goes spiritually. How can you walk out in the world and have confidence with God when there's something in your heart is not right? You're ashamed. Right? Shamefulness. Right? In your heart. No, that's not God's way. He wants His people to be confident. Right? 
clothed in his white raiment, not naked, not shamed, not shameful. Hebrews says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. It's a wonderful thing, the confidence that God gives. But Satan, the world, the flesh wants to throw it away, cast away. As a, I can always first John one night and get it back later if I want to. It's not that easy. I believe, yes, you can confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Yes, I believe that. God doesn't hold a grudge. If you truly repent and you make things right with him, he will forgive. And the fellowship can be restored. But you're not going to be back to where you were. You've lost ground. It's going to take some time to build that confidence back up where it needs to be. Like I said earlier, you lose more than you think. This is all happening spiritually. Again, if it's happening physically, you'd be all alarmed. You'd be, oh, I can't believe this. I better do something now. Right? I gotta call 911 now. This is this is bad, right? But because it's happening spiritually, you're not seeing it and physically until We need God's way, Raymond. We need that confidence that He gives. Mm. Don't give it up, Christian. Don't give it up for nothing. No. No, no, no. No devil, no world, no flesh. God must steal from me. And then the Lord says, the latter part of verse 18, And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So, that's the last thing. We're blind, so we need God's eye set. We're blind as a bat, unless we're in tune with the Spirit of God. True. It is He, talking spiritually, of course, it is He, the third person of the Godhead, who enlightens us and guides us. Does He not? So, why do you lack guidance in your life? Like, I you don't know, have the direction, I'm not sure to do. I, you know, I why do you lack guidance? Because you're blind. Right? Even though you're saved, right? be not in tune, you can be not yielded completely to the Spirit of God in your life like you should be, and get this blindness happen. Spiritual blindness. You know? right. Without Him, without the Spirit of God having His way within us, in other words, like Paul said, walking in the Spirit, not just, not are we just, you know, in the Spirit, um, but we've got to walk in the Spirit. We can't see the loss like we should. We can't see the hurts of others like we should. We can't even see our own faults like we should. We need the Spirit of God right, to enlighten us and help us to see these things. As we've already seen, we can be neutralized and not even know it. And know us not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Christ said that the Holy Spirit, He will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teach you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in Him. That abiding is so important. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, be filled with the Spirit. You don't just get the Spirit of God and when you get saved and then that's it. You know? uh, you're good then. You know, it's, we need to be filled with the Spirit all the time. Yielding to the Spirit of God, submitting to the Spirit of God all the time. Paul goes on to say in chapter 6 of Ephesians, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. 
every moment submitting to Him and God's will for you personally, not just the general will of God. We, we know the general will of God. We know what God wants to do generally speaking. But then there is the personal direction that the Spirit of God gives. This is why many times, sometimes Christians, even God's people, they've never been led to the Spirit of God in their life. They don't know what that means. Right. You talk to them like, huh? You know what I mean? I mean, let God leads you, directs in your life. Shows you who to marry. Uh, shows you where to live. Shows you what job to have. We don't just do things now that we're saved and we ask God to bless it. You know what I mean? I'm going to buy this house over here and I'm just going to ask God to bless it. Or I'm just going to get this job over here in this such and such a city and I'm just going to ask God to bless it. That's not how we live anymore. Okay? We're under Him. Okay? The Spirit of God is to have control. Be filled with the Spirit. What's the opposite of demon possession? Being filled with the Spirit. Him having control of you. Don't you get it? He wants control of you. Yeah. Right? That goes against the grain of the flesh, does it not? The flesh says, Ooh, but I still want some control. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm His now. I submit to Him. And I will, by the grace of God, keep this body under Right? Subjection. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want Him to have His way in my life. I want to understand and know what is the will of God for my life. That's an exciting thing. Yes. To know that God has a plan and purpose for your life. Well, you can't find that out if you just ask God to bless Him when you make a decision. Yeah. No, you ask Him first. You make sure it's okay with Him. You be led by the Spirit. God, God leads you in different ways. He uses His Word. He uses... Um, Impression you whether you know something is, is wrong, he can uh, disturb you about it, or or if he if he's okay with him, he can give you a peace about it, right? You, you're sensitive to the spirit of God, right? And uh, God can use people to give you counsel, uh, right? In your life, um, all these things God uses to lead you if you want to be. God's not going to force you. God doesn't force Himself anyone, not even His children. God doesn't force a lost person, a sinner, to be saved. No. God doesn't force His people to follow Him with all their heart. And to choose to be humble. You must make that choice. He's just letting you know, I don't like it when you're not. You make me say Because you're lukewarm. May God help us, amen, to be engaged and not neutralized. We can be neutral. You know? Not even know it. Not even realize to the extent of it. Ignorance is not bliss. I want to know. I want to know. I want God to show me where I am spiritually. I want to see it. God, show me! So I can make the corrections I need to make. So I can be where I need to be for Him. So I can know His purpose and plan for my life. And not be messing around, playing games with the devil in the world of my flesh. Yeah. You'll lose every time. And much more than you realize. Christmas Day, are you neutralized? The Lord goes on to say there in verse 19 again, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. You can get right. There's still hope. Are you still breathing? There's hope for you. I love you. God loves you. He wants to still work for you. Give you some of that gold, that wine raiment, that confidence, that eye salve, that enlightenment from the Spirit of God to guide your life. It's all there. It's all there for you. You can still have it. Amen. I want to leave with hope today. It says in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man hear my voice, and open the door. We've got to open it, though. Don't we? So I'm going to kick it in. 
It's not His way. God still respects your free will, even after you're saved. He's a good God. You know? If you were God Almighty, how would you be? Eh? <laughs> Oh, with that much power. All power! Yeah. All! Yeah. He's the Almighty. That's His name. Almighty. He's all power. Infinite power. How would you be? And yet, our God respects our free will. Even after we're His, even after He's bought us with His own precious, sinless blood, He still respects our free will. It's an amazing God. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Once that closeness with us. I know sometimes we use this as a salvation uh, type message. And it's true. I think we can use that. We can apply it in that way. But the true interpretation here is to the church. It's giving God's people. God wants a closeness with you. Will you be close with me? That's what God's saying. I want to be not just your father, but I want to be close to you. I want you to sit in my throne. I want to put my arm around you. I want us to be close. Amen. Don't you hear it today? Do you hear what the Spirit is saying to the church? Do you have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches? What He's saying to us in this day and age, this modern day? The church will lay to see. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's, uh, let's get out of the neutral zone. Let's get out of the unengagement. God help us, amen. To show us where we are what we need to change, what we need, amen. We know we need His gold, His white raiment, His eye salve. It would not be like maybe most of the church of this day, kind of relaxed and kind of like the day, just like, eh. we're saved, we're going to heaven, everything's good, you know. I don't know, not, not really zealous for God. And, you know, we've really... I think materialism has really hurt us in a lot of ways, you know. I mean, God blesses us, you know, with nice things, but you can't live for these things, live for the world, and get too caught up in this, you know. God's purpose, God's plan to use us to win souls and to be a good witness, right, and testimony and help others and um, just, yeah, to do His will, man, it's the most important thing. I know it's not easy, but, uh, the fight we have against the devil, the world, the flesh, but God's greater. Amen. Amen. And we are, as he calls his churches here, overcomers. We are overcomers. Don't forget that. So you don't have to be neutralized. Don't have to. You can say, no, 